Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. I want to remind everybody that today and tomorrow will be taking place the Taburo Symposium on Environmental Chemicals and Liberty Disease at the CTRB. And it was put together by Matt Cave and the GI Group with funding from another organization, a number of organizations, but particularly the National Institute of Health. We will have, we will be the host for a number of experts from across the nation who are going to be discussing topics related to environmental health, chemical pollution, and their impact on liver disease. I think if you have some time to go over to listen to some of these lectures, you will find it very worthwhile. I suspect that everybody in this room remembers what they were doing 13 years ago on this day. I know that I was sitting at my desk writing on the computer when somebody knocked on the door and said, Jesse, you got to see this. And I walked out the hall, followed him to the rec room where several physicians and staff had gathered around a small TV to watch two towers collapse. <coughs> 13 years later, there's been two wars, economy that goes downward, viruses attacking uh, a number of people with over 2,000 deaths, and we sit at the verge of yet another conflict, perhaps a crusade, with unclear ending. Now, I don't know anybody in this room knows what's right or wrong. I certainly don't. So all I can do is stand and remind you to pray for those who have perished and their families through all of these years because of this type of conflict, and to pray to keep the families and the men and women in uniform uh, away from harm's way. And we hope that those of you who have families and who have been involved in the military, we thank you for your service. And we certainly hope that this uh, next endeavor will be helpful for uh, the world as a whole. Now today, we recognize that we're fighting wars at many levels. We're fighting wars in this country as well. We're battling for avoiding health disparities and for health care for all. And there's two historical figures that I want to mention that are really relevant. One is Sylvester Graham. You might know him because he invented the Graham cracker. Uh, he was an American physician who would, died on this day in 1851. He was born in 1794. He was interested in human physiology and nutrition, and he gave a lot of lectures in the southeastern states. And those lectures together sort of became what was called the Graham system. It was a sort of a vegetarian dietetic theory. He advocated for the use of whole wheat for bread, hard mattresses, <laughs> open windows, fresh fruits and vegetables, pure drinking water, and cheerfulness at meals. Remember, this is in the early 1800s. Published his work called Lectures of the Science of Human Life in 1839, which became the leading text for health reform health reform in the early 1800s, and then its popularity sort of disappeared in the 1840s, and he died in 1851. The next person I want you to remember is Alexander Duncan Langmuir. He was born on this day in 1910, at the same time that Bailey Astor was in the Caribbean doing the things that we discussed last week. He was an American epidemiologist who was the head of an organization that he created called the Epidemic Intelligence Service for the United States government, and then became in 1949 the director of the epidemiology branch of what we know today as the CDC, and he served in that position for 20 years. His efforts contributed to the virtual elimination of polio and for the understanding of many infectious diseases since then, and he's sort of credited for saving thousands of lives for these efforts. <clears throat> these are people who devoted their lives to population health, to helping improve the health of, of their families, of their neighbors, of a population that they don't even know. <coughs> that's what this Grand Rounds is about. And with that, I will leave you with Barb Casper, who's going to introduce our special guest. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce our Grand Rounds speaker, Dr. Quandra Nesbitt. Um, Dr. Nesbitt obtained her undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan, followed by her medical school at Wayne State University in Detroit. She subsequently completed her family medicine uh, residency at the University of Maryland and was asked because of her leadership skills to stay on as a chief resident there. 
Upon completion of her residency, she completed a Common Health Fund Harvard University Fellowship in Minority Health Policy and received her Master's in Public Health at Harvard. Dr. Nesbitt has held several key roles in leadership in health policy, including being the Senior Deputy Director of Policy Planning and Epidemiology and Evaluation for the District of Columbia, the Acting Director for the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Administration for the District of Columbia, as well as the Senior Deputy Director of Community Health Administration for the District of Columbia. We were very fortunate in 2011 uh, to be able to uh, recruit Dr. Nesbitt to Louisville, where she became the Acting Medical Director of the Department of Public Health and then um, assumed the directorship in 2013. In addition to managing a complicated healthcare system for our community, Dr. Nesbitt is a member of numerous community boards of directors and maintains an adjunct faculty membership in the Department of Family Medicine and Geriatrics. She's also active in the School of Public Health and is a mentor and role model for several students here. She is sought as a speaker and is an expert on community health. We are very fortunate to have such a wonderful resource in our community, and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Laquanda Nesbitt, who will be speaking on the impact of the Affordable Care Implementation in Louisville. Dr. Nesbitt. You all can hear me, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So um, I'm just going to go right into the presentation because I have a bit of slides. Um, the way that I have to do this is I get asked to do a presentation. I think I know what they mean. Uh, so I try to limit the number of slides to what I think it will take me to get through. So if I don't talk about what you intended me to talk about, we have plenty of time for discussion for us to do that. Okay? So. I also am one of those presentation, presenters that my goal is not to get you through, through my slides, but to meet the intent of the invitation. So feel free to interrupt me uh, if you have a question or you want to have some discussion or dialogue. Now, uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, the Louisville, Kentucky story, has been told in a lot of large media outlets, uh, primarily for political reasons. We are a state that has a democratic governor. Most of our elected officials at the national level are Republican. Uh, but this is not intended to be a partisan talk, therefore the disclosure. Uh, so when we get into the discussion, many of the slides are not intended to get at any of those politics, but when we get into the discussion, I want to make sure that people understand that the views held in, in this presentation or disclosed through the Q&A are mine. They are not intended to reflect those of any of the elected officials uh, in, our, in, the, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, so because we are in an academic setting, there are learning objectives, Everybody have those? <laughs> Great. We can move on. Uh, and this is sort of how we'll move through the day. The Affordable Care Act is a very comprehensive piece of legislation. And um, I apologize in advance if I am going to bore any of you with this, but I think it's important for us to spend a little bit of time doing an overview of ACA, primarily because what I think has paralyzed us in this country around the discussion of the Affordable Care Act and what it can bring to many local communities is a fixation on the individual mandate and a conversation solely about the individual mandate and the constitutionality of the individual mandate and uh, the fairness of the individual mandate and how the individual mandate cripples businesses and free enterprise, et cetera. And we miss out on a lot of the other opportunities the ACA has to improve population health, that it has to give access to care to people who otherwise have not had it, that has to improve cost containment, quality improvement, and a host of other things. Um, and so I wanted to make sure we have an opportunity to highlight some of those because when we talk about local implementation, challenges and opportunities in the future for us as a community, many of those things become critical, critically important for us locally, more so than what happens with the individual mandate, which I think has pretty much been dealt with and is a done deal, okay? <laughs> so, um, here we go, we'll deal, so we're gonna deal with that first and just kind of get over it. Uh, so uh, healthcare coverage is one of the components of the Affordable Care Act. It requires most U.S. citizens and legal residents to have health coverage. Um, and we can have conversations about this. I've actually taken courses at, the, at law schools to get very, very in-depth with this. Um, 
But the, the, core, the core ways that many citizens can get access to this coverage uh, still primarily is through employer sponsor coverage. And then people have other options like uh, requiring employers with 50 or more full-time employees to provide this coverage with ha or have penalties, um, allowing states to expand Medicaid to individuals with uh, incomes at or below 133% of the federal poverty level, but there is a plus factor that allows that number to go up to 138% of the federal poverty level. And about half of the states um, elected to do that expansion. Um, provide advanced premium tax credits, which are, are often called, referred to as subsidies for people with incomes up to 400% of the federal poverty level, and then give some incentives to small businesses uh, to get some tax credits if they have fewer than 25 employees. So these are sort of the things, the financial incentives that are in place in the tax system um, or in the public insurance systems to help those uh, individuals meet that uh, requirement to have health insurance coverage in our system, in our in our country. Um, other things that happen in the healthcare cover space: is the ability for uh, individuals to maintain their dependence on their healthcare coverage until the age of 26, and that happened very early uh, in the process uh, for qualified health plans to have these 10 essential services be offered or uh, in their plans. Protect, prohibit lifetime limits and pre-existing condition exclusions, which was major. There were a lot of people who would end up with certain conditions that would prevent them from being able to get uh, insurance, especially in the individual market. Uh, and sometimes people would think of those things as being previously having a diagnosis of breast cancer and not being insurable in the future. Uh, but there were things like people would have reflux and not be insurable. So this became a major challenge. And when you think about things like proteomics being on the uh, horizon, uh, big pushes for genetic testing, uh, people having a diagnosis of, uh, or a family member who has breast cancer and then being told, or maybe you should have rapid testing, or people who have a family history of colorectal cancer and saying maybe you should have some type of testing uh, to determine your risk factors for that. People would shy away from those types of tests thinking that these pre-existing exclusions could apply to them in the future if they were ever uh, required to get health insurance in the individual marketplace. And then eliminating cost sharing uh, for any uh, preventive screenings that were considered to be great, uh, level A or B by the uh, USPSDF. Okay, um, and these are just some highlights, not all of the components of the, co of, of, the uh, of ACA. And so a couple of them here that are interesting are the Innovation Center at CMS, which comes with a lot of funding opportunities. I know that there have been some applications that have come out of uh, University of Louisville, um, some successful, some not, uh, to CMS. Uh, reduced payments. Uh, we had about 11 hospitals in the <coughs> top tier to get penalties in the state of uh, for readmissions, high readmissions rates for those conditions that were considered to be preventable. Uh, readmission, so we have a long way to go in that in that uh, regard. And then we re reduce Medicare payments for hospital-acquired conditions. Uh, we usually think, think about infections, but also falls that could be prevented in uh, hospital settings, et cetera, are included in this space. And most people know where Medicare goes, public payers are sure to follow. So a lot of these things are part of the cost containment strategy, where we used to think about volume was a big driver, now we're thinking about quality. Uh, being a big driver in the system. Um, so the next phase that the ACA uh, moved into was improving quality. So creating PCORI. How many of you are familiar with PCORI? Okay, definitely on the future challenges and opportunity slide for us in the future. Um, improving care coordination for dual eligibles, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, Medicare is a federally funded program for individuals typically thought of to be 65 and older or have a, um, certain types of chronic condition, blind, we typically think of blind, people with end-stage renal disease being eligible for Medicare. Uh, Medicaid is a state-operated program that gets a federal match depending on your poverty level. Uh, Kentucky gets a huge match because we have a high poverty level. Both operated out of the same entity. Don't talk to each other. Don't manage the dual eligibles. Created a program or an office that would help to, to uh, better manage that care, improve the quality of that care. And then there's another issue, as Dr. Roman mentioned, we have huge disparities in this country, a huge inequities in this country, and a lot of that challenge of being able to address it is we did not have a lot of data around certain subpopulations. And so making the requirements to be able to have to capture that data 
and certain facilities and all facilities actually that participate in Medicare and Medicaid programs, which is almost every um, healthcare facility. Um, workforce, how many of us recognize that we have workforce issues? <laughs> right, okay, it should be unanimous. I know I don't raise my hand when people ask questions of like, should be this, so I'm just gonna assume that you raised it mentally. All right, so um, <laughs> increase the number of GME slots, um, and if you didn't raise your hand, you might not agree with some of these things. I don't agree with everything in the ACA, so I'll just make some of you who don't comfortable, because I'll have that addition for you. Um, and with the emphasis on things in primary care and general surgery, uh, there, there was an intent initially to ratchet up some programs. And you know, going into medical school, I was kind of like, oh, I really want to do this primary care thing. But I, def I didn't do health professional shortage uh, area loan programs or any of those things. I was scared to death of a commitment. Like, I did not want to end up in a square state in the Midwest. <laughs> like, that was a major concern for me, right? Because they get to determine and dictate your placement. Because what if I ended up on a rotation and absolutely fell in love with it? And I always had the um, sort of the mindset that if you go through all of this, you need to finish and get up every day doing something you absolutely love. Right, so I think that most people who go into the field of medicine realize it's an art informed by science, you're driven by the passion, you wanna do it, you, actually, you absolutely should love it every day. And so there's some of these things around health professionals, professionals improvement through, uh, through scholarships and loans that just increased funding to existing programs but didn't really change how those programs operated. Um, so I just, in terms of workforce, I'll concede the yeah. in some of those things. Um, and then the increased funding for community health centers and school-based health centers was also part of the workforce strategy. Uh, prevention, wellness, and public health. Um, one of the things in this space that was really exciting was the requirement for nonprofit hospitals to actually do community health needs assessments um, and create community health improvement plans. Uh, are you all familiar with this requirement? And most hospitals are nonprofit, so it's really huge. Um, there are a few that are not, like Sloan Kettering um, is not. What this means is basically most hospitals uh, have a nonprofit or are tax exempt, and they're tax exempt because they provide charitable <laughs> care uh, through an uncompensated care program. If, in fact, most people are going to become insured, that uncompensated care, which is split through two two ways, you have charitable care and bad debt. Charitable care means you assume the people are never gonna pay you. You never bill them, you are indeed being charitable. That ends up going into your, helping to contribute to your tax exempt status. The bad debt means you chase them down to get the money and you never do. That is not charitable. You intended to get the money, you just couldn't capture it. You believe they had the ability to pay, if they didn't pay you. So if more people are becoming insured, that charitable care contribution is going to go down for most nonprofit hospitals. But their, bill, their need, because of their uh, budget, to have a, um, to meet a certain thresh, threshold of contributions to their community is going to remain according to the IRS. So what are they gonna spend their money on? It's not gonna be uncompensated care, but it needs to be something. And that needs to mix with whatever, match with whatever the community, community's health needs are. And so there needs to be some kind of demonstration that they're actually assessing the community's health needs. Um, establishment of the National Prevention, Health Promotion, and Public Health Council. Um, most of what contributes to a population's health, not an individual health, not, not individual's health, not what makes Dr. Casper healthy in a one-to-one -one interaction, but how do we change the tide of the health, the health outcomes for the 750,000 people who live in Jefferson County? There's a component of social determinants of health. And so the National Prevention Council is pretty much a way that all of the entities in federal government come together. We have the, the uh, cabinet secretaries in transportation and agriculture and education all to come together and realize how what they do in their space impacts people's ability to live healthy lives. So when we had an agriculture program that had a school lunch program that fed kids unhealthy food, <laughs> that contributed to poor health outcomes for us. And so when you create this council that allows for those discussions to happen, it, it oh, through a sequence of events, allows for us to improve the health outcomes of our community. So that was established through the ACA. Um, prevention and Public Health Trust Fund, which has been uh, under significant 
um, scrutiny through the ACA and is a huge fun funder into the CDC and sub subsequently into a lot of state and local public health departments, um, was created to become the way to fund comprehensive prevention programs, uh, such as like um, communities putting prevention to work. So when you start thinking about diabetes prevention programs, heart disease prevention programs, tobacco cessation programs, and then the very abstract things like community gardens, um, complete streets programs, bike lanes, those types of things. This is where that funding was supposed to come from and Congress has not done appropriations to that fund um, in the way that it was structured. Um, and then requiring chain restaurants to post calories by 2014 and many of those chain restaurants have already moved in that direction to begin to provide that information. All right, so what are we doing locally? Um, one of the lead uh, organizations um, for local implementation was the Louisville Metro Board of Health, which I'm going to take a little drink here because I'm always a little groggy in the morning while you all read that. <laughs> complete violation of the slide theory. So the Board of Health in, in Louisville, unlike other counties in Kentucky, doesn't govern its advisory. And so it has the ability to facilitate a lot of discussion, um, put its energy into mobilizing around a lot of efforts, and so uh, kind of creating an infrastructure for coordinating ACA implementation efforts was a great opportunity for um, the Board of Health. And so there's a local approach that created a steering committee very early on that said this is more than just getting people prepared for an individual mandate. Um, Early on, I was having conversations with the state uh, health benefit exchange, and it was very clear, it was enroll, enroll, enroll. And the message was, we're gonna improve the state, the health of Kentuckians by enrolling people <laughs> into Medicaid and qualified health plans. And I learned a very long time ago, having health insurance did not make people healthier. <laughs> and that was before I went to school of public health. Uh, kind of like, you know, when you have a diabetic patient in front of you, and you're like, I have told you everything to do to get your A1C better, and you never do it. So, and these were insured people with good jobs, and some of them well-educated. So, so recognizing that that wasn't necessarily going to be what made us healthier, we realized that we needed to take advantage of this point where there were going to be some people and some entities and organizations in our community fixated, maybe perhaps for the first time, on health. Whatever the heck that meant, they were going to be fixated on health in some kind of way. So how do we take advantage of that? So we brought together all of these key stakeholders to create a steering committee, uh, which is chaired by Bill Altman, who's currently the Board of Health Chair, and created these four subcommittees, Outreach and Enrollment, which gets at this notion of we need to get people enrolled, which is chaired by Bill Wagner. I chair the Health Literacy and Education Committee. Uh, Tim Markham chair, chairs Workforce Capacity, and then uh, Craig Blakely, who's the Dean of the School of Public Health and Information Sciences, chairs Evaluation and Outcomes. So we're kind of going through uh, what each of these committees do. So at the very beginning, um, these are numbers uh, created by the state because I'm going to poke holes at them so they are not mine, okay? And the state paid some big firm to come up with these numbers and we can all have a good laugh at it in a minute. Okay, so back last year, there was an estimate that about 101,000 people in Jefferson County were uninsured. And this is who we needed to reach through the enrollment process um, in the first open enrollment period. So getting people on board to get into Medicaid or qualified <coughs> health plan. Now, that number broke down to be about 47,000 of those folks were presumed to be eligible for Medicaid, which meant free, no copay insurance, and about 54,000 of those folks would be eligible for qualified health plans. We didn't know exactly where they would be in terms of eligibility for subsidies or not. Okay, so reading back into the literature, in terms of what happened in Massachusetts when they went through, through the universal health care piece, you don't get 100% people into your plans, and then, um, you know, we were a little bit lax with penalties. You know, not everybody, it was like $95 or 2% of your income. So not everybody was frightened about that. And then we also realized that when we were marketing it as connect with cartoon characters, 
People did not know what that was. It was we were well into April and people still didn't know that was health insurance that they needed to purchase by the end of the year and pay a penalty. So we set up these, we're gonna reach 60% of these people and 50% of these people. Now, this had a closed open enrollment period of March 31st. You can get in Medicaid anytime. So anytime you're determined to be eligible, you can get into the program. All right, so these were our goals we needed to reach. We needed to get, we were gonna get about 55,000 people into the program. And so we needed a concerted effort to do that. So we set up this group, we met every two weeks, 30 folks around the table, um, thinking about uh, KIPTA, uh, who the state funded to hire people to go out and do this work. The federally qualified health centers got money from HRSA, the Health, uh, health Resources and Services Administration, which is their primary funder, to hire people to get folks enrolled. And they were primarily focused on the people who came into their facilities who didn't have insurance, converting them to people who were insured. And then when they had time, they would go out to community events and get people insured. So part of the issue is, in this first year, you're only going to get people who come into facilities, right? Um, and then maybe if you go out to like the state fair, you might introduce somebody to a program, et cetera, right? So a lot of people are disconnected from healthcare systems, especially young people who don't get sick. They're just not, gonna, you're not gonna reach them between January and March or October and March. Uh, so we had this coordinate, coordinated effort and then we were able to identify problems with the system and there were all kind of interesting things going on. We got a lot of good press, but there are these people called super loopers who started applications in the system that just got stuck. And they just floated around in a computer system and nobody could find them. Okay, so that happened in Kentucky just like it happened at the federal level. But it was at a much smaller level. All right, so we dealt with those things like that at the outreach and enrollment. So you give somebody a little plastic card, and what does it mean? They still show up in the emergency room. They have no idea now what to do with this little plastic card. And then we also recognize that there are a lot of people who already have health insurance and have no idea how to use it. Um, how many of you see people, uh, I used to work in an urgent care when I first switched over to policy work, and I would see people Saturday morning at 10 o'clock with a stomach ache. And these were like 27 year olds. And I'm like, when did it start? I woke up this morning with it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, like, what happened to resilience? <laughs> <laughs> do we not do self-care in this country? So, you know, I'm thinking like, there's, you pay the copay, and then the insurance company's gonna pay. And so I'm just thinking about all these things that's just wrong. And so, there's a such that's needed, and we need to teach people how to use the healthcare system. When do you call somebody first? When do you go in to see somebody? All of these different things. And then there are different ways that people need to receive information. Some people can respond to a brochure. Some people need to be uh, need to have a telephonic interaction. Some people need to go in and physically see someone. And then some people need a coach or a community health worker because their health literacy is so poor that they just can't manage, right? And so we, re we recognize that there are gonna be all these different levels of touches that people need. But what was also more fascinating for me is as we brought this committee together, people would say, oh yeah, we're doing health literacy work, we're doing health literacy work, we're doing, and I'm like, if all of these people are doing health literacy work, why are we so health illiterate? <laughs> it was just so fascinating to me. And so then I started demanding that people describe what they were doing and got to the, got to the bottom line, what people were really saying is, yeah, I teach people what it mean, what a deductible means. I teach people what uh, what a copay means, et cetera. And so we were able to better categorize that some people are doing health insurance benefits literacy. Some people are attempting to do health care systems literacy. Like this is when you go to a primary <laughs> care physician. This is when you need a specialist. This is when you go to the ER. This is when you go to a pharmacy and do self-care. Um, all of these things, and then this is health behavior literacy, like why smoking is bad for you, uh, how do you manage diabetes, that kind of thing. Uh, and so we're working collaboratively through the health literacy and education group, but early on as a companion piece for this very small brochure that the state created that said get health insurance, we decided that it was still more than just getting health insurance. We still needed to teach people the fundamentals of good health behaviors, we still wanted people to be to, to get plugged into patient-centered medical homes or primary source of care 
and then enforce this message of if you don't have health insurance, get it, right? So capitalizing on this opportunity and then sneaking in our dig on please don't flood emergency care. And if this is wrong, you go to urgent care instead. And it's very, it's very, uh, still very, very uh, interesting to me to find. I mean, I'm, there are attorneys in this community that don't know you can go to urgent care when your kid kind of gets hurt at a soccer game and get an x-ray. It's just very fascinating. Uh, workforce capacity commu uh, committee. There's a lot of concerns, obviously, about whether or not when you have 101,000 newly insured people, can your system handle it? Um, I say the problem's not as bad as people think. Most people would, would like to throw a tomato at me when I say that, who are already in the, working in the system. Um, I have a different vantage point. I get to talk to a lot of people and ask a lot of prob probing questions. I know that there are a lot of inefficiencies in the system. I know that there are places that have no-show rates of 40%. I know that there are places that don't yet have patient impanelment, that have not gone to open access or modified open access. Um, a lot of things that can happen to create more <coughs> capacity in the system. And so until we do those things, we can't say we need more bricks and mortar. Now, yes, we do need more providers. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it's probably not a one-to-one -one ratio in the way that we're trying to make it seem because we haven't dealt with the inefficiencies that exist. But what we don't have is um, I maintain licenses in three states. The other two states ask me actually what I do every day. Kentucky does not. So I'm listed as a family physician in Kentucky. <coughs> you cannot walk up to me anywhere and see me as your family physician. DC and Maryland knows that very clearly, <laughs> that I have no active practice. I do not accept Medicaid. But they ask me those questions. What percentage of your time do you spend at X practice? Do you accept, act, are you actively accepting Medicaid patients, et cetera? So when they apply for their HPCA or health professional shortage areas and medically underserved area designations, they can exclude me. Here, I'm just counted as part of the ratio. And so it makes it very difficult to be able to understand those ratios. And then they also sometimes don't do a good job with subspecialties uh, in identifying what, exactly what you do in your subspecialty practice. Um, and then do changes in care delivery models change our workforce needs? So if we're on a PCMH movement where everybody in the practice is expected to work to the level of their highest level of their credential, do you still need the same level of MDs and DOs than if everybody is still not working at the highest level of their credential? So if your, all your physicians in your practice are calling in prescriptions, for two hours of the day, do you still need the same number of physicians that, that you would if the physicians were the ones actually spending time practicing medicine? So those are the types of questions that the workforce capacity group is trying to answer. Extremely difficult because a lot of the data is missing. Um, evaluation and outcomes. Part of what they do is conduct sort of the process evaluation to see if the goals and objectives that the other committees are trying to reach actually can be reached. So when the workforce capacity group is trying to answer questions, they go around trying to find the data, <laughs> finding what studies have already been done, those sort of types of things. And the reason why the dean of the School of Public Health is a chair, because they can find graduate researchers and students to help assist with some of this work. And then um, back in 2010 or 2011, I was on a panel at the uh, law school in Maryland with a couple of other folks. And the closing question was, how would we know that um, ACA worked? And everybody gave an interesting question. I said, because the health outcomes in this country would get better. And so that's what the evaluation and outcomes group is also expected to track. Over time, not today, not tomorrow, we would expect that the health outcomes of our community would get better if, in fact, ACA is working. Set to be the goal. All right. All right. So what has happened as a result of all of this? So in 2012, I consider it to be a sensible event. Baptist Norton and U of L, now Kentucky One, uh, but all of the other, other hospitals that now make Kentucky One, we all got together and sat around the table at the health department's boardroom and we created a survey and did a community health needs assessment. The first time all of those health systems had ever gotten together in recent memory to do anything together. <laughs> <laughs> and they agreed in principle.
able to all share it, not with each other, but at least with me. So, <laughs> and they agreed that if there were areas where, you know, for example, if they were all going to say, we're all going to do obesity, uh, behavioral health, and tobacco, and then no one was doing um, uh, maternal and child health and immunizations or something, then I could redirect, right? And that was extremely helpful for us as a community to be able to say there are some areas that came up as needs that aren't being addressed. So that was major for us. Um, and then that we were able to take that work and roll it into the Healthy Global 2020 plan that was released for the city in February of 20, uh, 2014. And if you haven't had a chance to look at that, you can go to healthyglobalmetro.org and take a look at that comprehensive plan because it sets forth where we want to be in the community by 2020. And it's a public accountability tool because it actually has um, an active tracker of our status and making progress toward those goals. Uh, we applied for a community transformation grant, which was funded through that Prevention and Public Health Trust Fund that I showed you all that Congress doesn't appropriate. Um, and as a result of that, um, the Housing Authority has agreed that all public housing moving forward will be smoke free. Uh, the new development, Shepherd Square, that was demolished just down the road at um, sort of, if you cross Broadway, around Jackson and um, Lambton, though, that area. It's newly constructed, 100% smoke-free, green, sustainable community. We'll have community gardens, et cetera, 100% smoke-free. Um, they are also now moving to, uh, as current tenants in public housing sign leases, they're transitioning into smoke-free units. And as more ten most tenants begin to sign smoke-free units, buildings will convert to smoke-free. We have private landlords who are convo converting to smoke-free units. Um, may sound trivial, but if you think about the number of people with asthma and COPD who live in multi-housing uh, multi units, who get exposed to secondhand smoke, becomes a trigger for them, in and out of hospitals and facilities becomes a win for us as a community. Um, working with JCPS around coordinated school health efforts, one of the biggest barriers to improving child health is we simply do not have good data to make good decisions and do targeted interventions. And that was, the, that was supported through that work. And then being able to do patient-centered medical home interventions with the federally qualified health centers who have no-show rates at the time that I got here between 25 and 40%. And have been able to cut those through a number of interventions down between 7 and 15%. Still trying to find the magic space between the modified access approach uh, for, me, for some of those facilities and sites. Um, healthcare system capacity. Uh, the federally qualified health centers have been able to leverage a lot of funding through, oh, the, I forgot to tell you all the good part about this. So it got cut through in the third, <laughs> third year of five. Um, the funding will end September 29th, but they had to just change the name of the grant program, so we think we're just going to get funded under another funding stream called Pitch Partnerships and Community Health. So it's all these games that people play with this grant thing. It's just annoying because then we had to write, spend two, two months writing a new proposal to do the same work under a new funding stream. Uh, federally qualified health centers have received capital investment, so you're seeing a new building being built on Broadway, East Broadway for fa uh, Family Health Center to increase its capacity of the current East Broadway um, location. Everybody you see across the nation received funding for increased demand for services. Uh, they receive funding for their in-person assisters to convert their uninsured to insured through um, the Affordable Care Act and individual mandate provisions. And then most recently received funding to support primary care and behavioral health integration efforts. Okay, so this is when we get to have fun again with the numbers. Okay, so remember our estimated eligible, this is where we are currently. So over 82,000 people in Jefferson County are newly insured. This is what I find very interesting. 70,000 of those people are on Medicaid, which is 148% of their estimated number. But here, it's only 12,000, which is 22%. So I think they mix these up. Some of these people, I think these people here should have been here. Which to me means that <coughs> more people are probably living in poverty in Kentucky than folks assume. And what's also most disturbing is a lot of these folks here are 18 to 35.
So we have a lot of our young people who are working for or poor, and that's extremely disturbing in a in a in a state in, ter- in a county in terms of our economic vitality and competitiveness. Um, so overall, this is why we keep getting so much fame is because because we've got really really good numbers. If you look at the next slide. This one is a little bit difficult to see, and I have like the backup data I could show you all. But these numbers continue to rise past <laughs> the open enrollment deadline here because Medicaid enrollment is ongoing. Here you're starting to see it taper off. People are stopping paying their premiums. And it's a small number, it's about 200 to 300 people a month out of that total 12,000. Um, so we are doing, we're going to try to do some focus groups and understand the rationale behind that. The most popular plan is a silver plan, which comes with a high deductible for folks. So there's some implications around that. So this notion of whether or not the health care is actually affordable, um, the experience with health care that people are having, so some assumptions could be that while my preventive services may be free, if I thought that I was having shoulder pain for seven years and I was finally going to get my MRI, and my deductible is $6,000, and an MRI is $1,200, and I still have to pay that $1,200 out of pocket, I just might stop paying that <coughs> because I, my health care, in my mind, isn't really affordable. So we're trying, we, we, those are the things we believe anecdotally are happening, but we're trying to get a hold of some of those folks uh, to be able to figure that out. Um, now, we published these slides back in <coughs> April, so it's the data immediately after open enrollment, but it follows the same patterns. And essentially, this is a picture of Jefferson County. Now, poverty tends to be more, uh, lower income households tend to be more in West and South. Um, and so, looking at the Medicaid enrollees, they tend to be more densely populated because the, dark, the darker brown is higher numbers of Medicaid enrollees. So you're going to see more densely populated Medicaid enroll, enrollment in the West and South. But when you look at qualified health plans, they're going to be more densely populated out east. So we actually saw that by our income lines. Now, I ripped these slides out of a presentation that was given at the budget hearing by Ken Marshall, who's the, you know, the CEO who runs the hospital here. You all know Ken. So these are the patient trends of uninsured cases looking at fiscal years 2009 and 2014. You can already see a percentage decrease immediately from 13 to 14. And in his second slide, looking at the payer mix, self-pay patients, looking at July 2013 to April 2014, <coughs> already at 6%. Now the backstory to this gets back to that deductible piece. This just simply means at the time that they presented to the emergency room, they had a payment source, which is good news for the university. They still have to capture that payment, and you know, that's sort of 90 days where you're trying to capture that payment. When that person gets that bill, and it says, oh, yeah, you still have to meet your deductible through your insurance company. University is going to be in a position to still have to try to capture those dollars. So over the course of the fiscal year, um, the overall financial position for the hospital, we still need to see what it's going to look like. But in terms of payer mix, we've seen immediate change. Rip the same slides from family, uh, for, for, for uh, family Health Center, which is another safety net provider in terms of impact. Okay, you can ignore these down here because basically what they do is for their self-pay patients, they create these classes, okay? 6A is pretty much the people who are in the tier that are most likely to become Medicaid eligible immediately with that change from 100% federal poverty level to 133% poverty level. So those are the folks here who, when the change happened from December to January, immediately come here. So they had an immediate switch and folks becoming from going from uninsured to Medicaid. <laughs> and same thing reflected here, looking at April of 2013 to April of 2014, 51% uninsured to 20% uninsured. Now, in their space, less of an issue because we're not talking about people with qualified <coughs> health plans. University 
It's pro it, it may be more QHP. We don't know exactly this, how this would break down between Medicaid and QHP. Here, this is obviously a Medicaid self-pay switch. So they're going to get reimbursement for those folks. This is actually going to add to their bottom line. Now, impact to public health programs. Uh, immediately, we could not find people who needed our free colorectal cancer screen. <laughs> there was no one to meet the eligibility requirements anymore. Okay? Same thing for breast and cervical cancer screening. The state actually ended up with a surplus of $650,000 in the breast and cervical cancer screening program this year. And the same thing <coughs> happened in the Title X program. <coughs> you end up with a surplus of funding in those programs for family planning. Because the demand for those services, people switch out of income eligibility for those programs into Medicaid. The majority of folks switch into Medicaid for those programs. And because these programs are under the a grade A or B, USPSTF, even if they're in qualified health plans, they have no copay. So it gets out, it's, it's not caught up in the whole deductible device, <coughs> with the exception, exception of colorectal cancer screening in the event that there's a polyp and it becomes di uh, treatment and di diagnostic and treatment as opposed to screening. And so we basically decided to diminish some of our services and stuff as a response to that. Okay, challenges and opportunities so we can do some quick Q&A. Um, we need to increase our outreach, outreach efforts, obviously, to the qualified health plan eligible folk, because uh, the Medicaid piece, we clearly outdone ourselves in that area, um, but have a long way to go. Um, the other space is the small business community. Um, I didn't show you all data there. What we find when, our, when the, the, the in-person assisters sit down with small business people and they talk about their options, it's, it's in the best interest of the people who work in the, for a small business uh, man or woman for them not to offer a plan and them to purchase plans through the exchange financially in terms of the cost. And so that whole strategy needs to be revisited. Um, we still have people who are going to emergency rooms instead of establishing a primary source of care. So we clearly need to accelerate our efforts of the Health Literacy Committee. Um, we have a process of we're in the, almost done with completing a comprehensive curriculum that can be portable, used by any institution. Um, we should be finished with that by mid-October. Um, we need to better understand the roles of ACOs and clinically integrated networks. The only ACO uh, that had completely gone through the Medicare pro uh, uh, process was at Norton, and I think they kind of abandoned. Uh, and then there's a couple in, that are um, independent primary care providers. Uh, there's one here for that, and then you have MDTUs that's doing a demonstration project uh, through CMS here as well. Uh, we need more support for population health efforts. Um, there have been a couple, but as soon as the funding turns out, we don't have good support from payers to change the payment um, models to support the sustainability <coughs> of these efforts in the long term. And so that makes it extremely difficult to be able to integrate things like community health workers into efforts um, that will help with a lot of these initiatives that have been piloted, demonstrated to work around readmission efforts and initiatives, uh, and things that are geared toward helping with the social determinants of health problems. <coughs> Um, we lack a process to evaluate impact of state level policies. I mean, all of this discussion around mm -hmm. scope of work. Uh, the literature is telling us that nurses, nurse practitioners and PAs graduate from medical school and go into specialties at the same rate as medical students. So I have no idea why we think in Kentucky there is a solution to the primary care problem. And so we need to figure out <laughs> if in Kentucky they're going to solve the primary care problem. I, and, and are we tracking whether or not the implementation of the policies around scope of practice are actually going to lead to, to solving the, the primary care problem? And I don't know that we have a, a process in place for that and any other policy that might get implemented for that matter. Um, and, and how do we, uh, you know, Corey, oh, I wanted to definitely mention this because here, here's something that does irritate me a little bit, and I think you all can help me with that. I get emails from people in a school of medicine, a school of social work, um, less from the School of Public Health because I'm on the faculty there. But, and they'll say, hey, Dr. Nesbitt, we haven't met yet, but I'm Dr. So-and-so, and I'm working such and such, and I'm working on this grant, and we'd like to write you in for your expertise in working with the community. It's due in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. And it irritates the crap out of me. <laughs> for one, I mean, here's why. Because I'm more than willing, and I'm very excited to work with you. 
but I can't help you in two weeks, okay? I have no idea what you're trying to do. Um, and most of the time, you can't send me an abstract, whoever you people are, um, even though your grant is due in two weeks. And sometimes they're PCORI grant. And by definition, PCORI stands for patient-centered. So you're coming to me to help you find the patient-centered component, which means you've already failed. There's no way the thing is going to get funded because it's not patient-centered. And so we need to figure out how to better engage and interact upstream. Like when you first start working on your proposal, say, hey, can we talk about this? Can we map out a process? And that would be more, far more exciting. And PCORI has like four funding cycles a year. And I was actually speaking with their executive director back in May, and they now have um, sort of these uh, planning grants. They're not sort of, they're actually planning grants for people like us who meet each other two weeks before the actual implementation grant is due. So we can kind of plan. We can get money to plan together if that's our deficit. So I think, I think that's sort of what our challenge has been, why Louisville hasn't been able to, University of Louisville hasn't been able to land a CTSA, et cetera, because we meet each other at the wrong time. And so it's not that the, pro that the project isn't well-intentioned, not that the researchers don't want to do good work, it's just that we can't manufacture a good proposal with only two weeks left before the deadline, and I can't add value not really understanding exactly what it is you're trying to accomplish. So we have a lot of opportunities that we could do through PCORI, and because we complain so much about the well that's drying up in NIH, PCORI is a great opportunity to get <coughs> extramural funding into the university. Um, and the other thing is I meet a lot of entrepreneurial people in Louisville. They have no idea what tools clinicians really need, and they come up with some weird stuff. <laughs> weird stuff. And somebody's going to back it, and you all can really be taking advantage of that space because you know what tools you need that would actually help you and help your patients. And so figuring out how to take advantage of that innovation space and be more entrepreneurial would be extremely helpful. I mean, some of the things that people come up with, um, you know, this will help it to help reduce anxiety of kids in the ER. And I'm like, that's not why they're crying. I mean, they're crying because I have on a darn white coat. Like, by the time I numb them, I can have a conversation with them while I'm suturing their face. So, like, painless, like, suture with anesthetic isn't going to do anything. Like, it's the fact that I have a needle in my hand coming toward their face that's the problem. You can't make a needle invisible because I need to see it. So, I mean, those are the types of issues that they don't understand. You know what I mean? So, it, it's that kind of thing that I think physicians could do a lot better in that space. So that's kind of like the end, and I think we have only like a couple minutes for questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was very informative and entertaining. It was, it was wonderful. Uh, and I just text my secretary to make sure she doesn't send that abstract that I was about to send. <laughs> uh, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned, you made a great statement, and that was that um, if the ultimate goal of the ACA was to have people insured, we've already claimed success. But you stated very appropriately, I think, that just having insurance doesn't make you healthy. Mm -hmm. And yet, you also stated that another outcome variable is if the indices of health go down, then that means the ACS has been successful. That may take years Yes. while we spend money. Are there variables, parameters, outcomes that can be measured earlier so that we don't track on this same area for the next two decades without knowing if this ultimately is going to improve yeah. I, I, you know initially what I would recommend is really focusing on appropriate care settings people receiving care in the appropriate care settings I think would be one of the one of the initial indices around the healthcare utilization piece um, the whole health outcomes thing is extremely difficult to do because it takes it, it's so um, it's influenced by so many different factors but um, the, I learned this new term yesterday, rigify, reinventing government every four years because there's new people get elected. And so we're short-sighted in that way. But if, if you think about it from this perspective, if you take people <coughs> whose health outcomes are impeded because they don't seek care appropriately from a consistent provider, so you create a care plan that if followed appropriately would improve the health outcomes of that individual. However, 
They then go to an urgent care, emergency room, et cetera. And let's be realistic, health information exchanges are not going to happen for us here in this space really anytime soon when we're interacting with people outside of our networks, right? Even if this becomes a really good clinically integrated network within the Kentucky One system, there's still gonna be some limitations to what happens outside of that space. That care plan you create gets uh, manipulated so much so by the time that patient comes back to you three months, six months from now, you don't even recognize it anymore, what that patient is doing. If that patient could do better at getting care in the, in the appropriate setting, communicating in the appropriate way when they have signs of distress, um, don't feel well, whatever, whatever the metrics of that care plan are, and they're supposed to contact you and your patient care team, being able to track whether or not people are doing that, in my opinion, would be a good process measure for us eventually getting to those improved health outcomes. So if we could see an improvement in that space, I think it would be a good indicator that we're eventually <laughs> going to get to those improved health outcomes. So, so that, to me, would be a good short-term indicator that we're well on our way, just in that space. Now, the whole um, quality stuff uh, gets really tricky because we like to risk adjust. And I think risk adjustment <coughs> is bad. Um, people don't like to hear me say that, but risk adjustment just gets us back to disparity. I think it does. So, throw tomatoes now. But I think it does. I'm thinking about that. Not the tomato thing. I'm thinking about that statement. <laughs> say, say, say more about that. So, okay. So, if you think about pay for performance strategies, for example, and um, pay for performance strategies, this, this is what got me into my fellowship. So, <laughs> pay for performance strategies are designed so that we create uh, benchmarks for providers to reach. Right? And then we pay them based on reaching those strategies. So, if I want to get my payment, I may cherry pick. I may pick patients who I think can help me meet my targets. So, in order to make sure that we don't make payments to patients who have difficulty reaching those targets locked out of certain providers, we come up with this risk adjustment scheme. Oh, okay, well they have more, they have more comorbidities, they have more social factors. They are publicly insured, so they're likely to live in social conditions that prohibit them from being able to do X, Y, Z. So we're going to risk adjust and allow you to not meet or only have to meet at 40% for those patients and be able to get your payment. Whereas this person who has patients who don't have those social barriers, et cetera, should be able to have 70%. So you're still going to have disparities under those kind of contexts. So, I, I think that there are certain things that if you start putting those same um, risk adjustments in place with these inappropriate care settings stuff, we're just going to keep still having disparities. So whatever you put in place for your process measures, it needs to be the same across all institutions. <coughs> Everybody has to aspire to it. Okay. Questions? Hey, Jason Roberts with Gastroenterology. Thanks for your talk. Very interesting. You're, you're a great ambassador for health policy. But uh, now that everybody has a ticket into the healthcare system with insurance, we're finding that communication is a big problem, and everybody in the room can attest to that. And in the county here, uh, the number of patients that no show because we cannot contact them through any of their listed contacts is a huge problem. And a lot of them are being sent to us from these federally funded uh, clinics and so on and so forth. So, how do we fix that problem? That seems to be in 2014 uh, fixable. Thing. Absolutely. I don't disagree with you. Um, now, the challenge is, is that there has been um, very little system level integration. So much of what has happened between these institutions has been relationship. So there's someone in your office who knows someone in their office, and they call each other. And when those two people don't show up for the day, a ball gets dropped. There is no way to create a system of care for anybody. And so what, uh, you all know John Morse, because he floats around here in like 17 different roles. Um, right now he's doing something family and geriatric medicine. So John and I are members of the Louisville Primary Care Association where the federally qualified health centers are the other two members. And what we have been pushing them to do through their PCMA certification is to be more 
standardized in creating systems of care in terms of these care transitions issues. So it's not so much of print a spreadsheet and figure out, oh, we have a patient that needs to go to U of L gastroenterology and we assume that they're going to go over here, et cetera. So one of the projects that we're working on now is this issue of referrals. And I can tell you now how they track a referral, it doesn't even make sense. It's like referral made. Well, what exactly does that mean? And it's like, oh, we think it's the doctor made the referral. Well, does that mean the physician in the practice made a referral to the referral coordinator in the practice? Does that mean the practice made the referral to U of L? Does that, like, what does that mean? So some of this patient communication stuff isn't the patient's fault, it's the practice's fault. And we have to figure out how to, how to make that really clear. Um, the other thing is that through PCMH, there should be a verification of the patient demographic information at every visit. And that has not happened in their previous iteration. And so now they're going through and they have to do these quality checks at every visit in terms of verifying patient demographic information, having a patient sign off on it, et cetera. So as those types of things happen in order for them to do their, to maintain their PCMA status, which they just got last year, the end of last year, you're gonna be able to see better management of that patient demographic information. So it's completely fixable in 2014. Since the, since the university is becoming one of the primary providers for uh, undocumented, uh, under-resourced personnel, and you have all this unspent money uh, on the public health side from the state. Do you see some of that money being diverted towards this growing population? That, Karen? We're, we're, so, so here's the thing. Federal dollars, some of the federal dollars can't be spent in that way. So do you have an approach to them then? <laughs> <laughs> Send her an abstract. No, no, no. So, so I mean, it's, it's a very real question because this is one that the state has to decide what its position is. I came from D.C. We insured everybody. We had a separate state-funded program that insured our undocumented residents. Our insurance rate for the state of, or the District of Columbia, which is fighting for statehood, was at 98%. But nobody ever talks about it. It's called the D.C. Alliance. So we had a separate program that gave people insurance regardless of their documentation status, and it dealt with those issues. So where a federal program, I'll give you a perfect example. The federal government says that you don't have to ask for documentation of legal status to screen people, but state Medicaid requirements requires documentation of legal status in order to treat them. So I can find your cancer for breast and cervical, <laughs> but I can't treat it. So ethically, why the hell would I want to find it? <laughs> if I can't treat it. So, but it, there's nothing to prevent the state from setting up a separate fund as people who want to take care of the people who reside in our state to fund it. But the, the state resources that are left over in those programs cannot be deployed to pay for the treatment services of those individuals. Can't happen. Last question. I was just going to say that um, in regards to what Dr. Roberts was talking about and with uh, some of the things that you said, information overload to the clinician, the person that's supposed to be Kind of the uh, you know the ultimate uh, point of, of, of coordinating care is is overwhelming, Absolutely. and the current fee for service model uh, doesn't pay for these people to help implement uh, the communication. You know you have all these you know drop points along the way and making consults, uh, this and that, and I mean there's nobody to help manage this, and the physician can't be spending two hours calling prescriptions but yet the models that don't allow for people to be hired to uh, make those things happen. Right. So we have to really. Yeah, <laughs> so we're work, uh, one of the projects that we're working on is um, better PCMH implementation. Um, and there's a group in town, the Kentucky and a healthcare collaborative that's uh, sort of spearheading that effort uh, with us um, and is hosting a number of sessions locally. Uh, and in my opinion, rightfully being attentive to sort of the private provider space uh, uniquely because there's a, there's a clinically integrated network movement that's happening with all of the major health systems that should <coughs> penetrate eventually to ULP and all of your practices, hopefully at warp speed. Um, that will help to address these issues. The fundamental barrier is that the payment reform has to happen to support these practices. Patient-centered medical homes has to, which can happen in a specialty practice. This is not a primary care phenomenon. 
has to allow everybody to work at the level of their credential, which removes the physician from, from filling out a bunch of paperwork and allows you to practice medicine, right? But it has to allow you to create a payment structure that says for every visit, 10% of the reimbursement will go to this person who coordinates the office visit and, and pays for that person to coordinate the office visit. And that big payment reform has to happen. We have failed to have our public insurance providers in this state, i.e. Medicaid and its managed care organizations, begin to compensate us for PCMH. And until they do, I don't know how the public sector, I mean the private sector will, will follow. They have in some other states. They've been able to do demonstration projects. Now, if a good clinical, clinically integrated network begins to have that model, assume sort of some of those risks, which I think will have to happen. You can't keep having these high readmission rates and not realize that you're gonna have to begin to do some things differently and not be paid for it initially. And then as a part of being a clinically integrated network means you get a good bargaining chip with the insurance companies, begin to say, you're gonna have to pay us for all this stuff we're doing and you're not paying us for. And that's why we've been able to improve patient outcomes as a result of doing all these things, these things you aren't paying us for or else we're out of your network. And that I think is gonna eventually come down to that. Dr. Leffy, thank you so much. Um, I think we're up to the start, and we have good people there. So thank you all, and have a good day. Appreciate it. Thank you.